You know, we've had a lot of content this afternoon, and, um, and it also makes me, as a liberal arts major, so appreciative of people who are good at science and chemistry. <laughs> so, but um, it's amazing to have a, a, a group of people here in our community who are dedicated and focused on ALS and motor neuron disease and the syndrome that this that this diagnosis is. And I think one of the things that I would just like, we have our opportunity here to ask some questions, both about drug development, basic science, clinical advances. Um, so we want to give the opportunity to everyone in the room to ask your questions. There are cards that you can write your questions down on, and there will also be a roaming microphone. Um, but I like to start off with uh, uh, just to, to open it up with a question of the panel is as you guys listened to, as, as all of you listened to one another present, what were your takeaways from your colleagues? I thought my job was done. You're just making it more and more difficult. <laughs> I think there's a, a couple of movies I'd like to go and watch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I learned not to more, play poker with Dr. Olney. But, uh, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, I think emotions and, and the pseudobulbar affect, and you know, we didn't talk much about Nudexa, which although it doesn't maybe affect the progression of the disease, but it is helpful. And really a lot of what we do uh, with ALS is try to make people more comfortable and try to improve the quality of life as much as possible. So, I mean, thank you for your research and, and with the Imaging, I would be interested in, in learning more. You didn't have time because yeah. Lance didn't yeah. allow you, but uh, I think that would be extremely important. And, and we all talked about biomarkers today, how they help us understand the disorder better and how they help us sometimes see if a, if a drug is going to work faster than just watching the clinical uh, progression of patient. And of course, as Dr. Beckman who's, uh, you know, a lot of things that he presented are way more complicated than what my brain can understand. But I think that's, you know, these are steps in the direct cor direction, in the, in the correct direction, where really understanding different compound, how to modify. I mean, I think, unfortunately, a lot of the drugs that were tested in ALS that didn't make it in clinical trials may actually work just by modifying very minor, minor atoms and, and making them you know, work better and, and making them reach the motor neuron in, in a in concentrated fashion just uh, rather than um, you know, giving like minocycline, which you know, could be really promising in labs, but we don't really understand why it doesn't help in real life. So thank you both for the work that you are doing. So um, I'll start by saying I've when I came to Oregon, the ALS local organization was non-existent. It was just getting off the ground and Lance took over. But there also was not much support. OHSU was not a place to go to if you had ALS. And it's actually, pardon? I came in 2001, okay? Um, it's changed, and it's a lot of hard work, and getting the recognition for that clinic is amazing. Um, and others have been at it. So now you have three really good clinicians, and so with the Copper ATSM and the company that's doing this, I've had them come and meet, and I'm wrestling their arm of saying, you know, Portland is a good place to come do the clinical trial. And I, Slippery. I keep thinking we've got them coming to the U.S. and then there's something else that goes on. So it's uh, a real drama about drug development. But I think there's a lot of promise here, and this has actually become a leading center uh, so that it's helping the community here a lot, too. And I'm really excited to see you here, Nick. Nice. Am I on? Hello? Yeah. I mean, I really like both your guys' talks as I sit here between you. Uh, but, yeah, I think just the incitement about... I mean, I think just the, the slide you showed about the, you know, increasing publications of ALS, and I think, I think myself as kind of a young researcher, I think I've been kind of been able to benefit from a lot of these newer grants that are coming out and, and things like that. So I think a lot of the excitement, and this was really exciting to see the, 
uh, you know, good review of all the clinical trials and then some very, uh, you know, details of uh, the copper trials. Awesome. Great. Thank you guys so much. Um, is there anyone who's opening up to the floor? And we do have a roaming mic uh, uh, right there. Amanda, can you raise your hand up and we'll get that to you. Thank you. I actually have two questions, but uh, the first one is the most important, at least to me. Uh, are there significant drugs that have been approved by European, Latin, Eastern uh, nations for use in research in ALS that we may not be considering here in the U.S.? Anybody? Okay. So I think the answer is no. Adarabon was actually recognized in Japan. Uh, and it was approved for stroke many years ago. And the reason you take it intravenously is that was how they were giving it to stroke patients. Okay. And the FDA actually did a really good job of encouraging the company to come to the U.S., test it, and help guide them to go from a failed, uh, the first a phase three trial was a failed one to go to a second one to investigate it. And so within the community, I've heard it of, well, Darabon doesn't work, it's a bad drug. It shows how low the bar is. But in fact, for a disease that's this desperate, that there was a, actually a lot of work to try to bring something in early. And now the next phase is actually making it work better. Okay. okay. I heard a reference to something being done under research in Israel, and is that research being recognized here, and are we able to benefit from the research? So I can tell you I read the literature every day, and the good news is there's 1,600 publications on ALS. Hey. The bad news is it's really hard to keep up with everything that's going on in all the different trials. Um, and each of us may actually have a completely different perspective of what's working, what isn't. There are a ton of things that are being tried, and some have very small effects. Uh, and this is part of the swarm behavior. of um, If something really does start to work and someone else can reproduce it, then people will hone in on it. Um, a lot of the initial studies that look promising, you know, you have to get your paper published, so you try to make it look as good as possible, and uh, the first results may not be there. The one trial that you can get overseas that's not in the U.S. is stem cell therapy, and that's a really good thing because there's a lot of, I think, shoddy work that's being done and overpromised uh, that actually does more damage, and you know, there, it's actually I think hurting the the real work being done with stem cells that's starting now. I see. Thank you. The, um, uh, just to clarify, there's no drugs overseas that is approved for ALS that we don't have access here to the U.S. So the, the, uh, it's actually the other way around. Aderavon is not yet available in, in, in Europe, or I think, I don't know if it's available in Canada either yet. So it is available in the U.S. Um, and same thing for Relizol. Uh, the uh, I don't know which researcher specifically uh, talking about the one in Israel, but the Brainstorm uh, is an Israeli company, and that's the stem cell trial. And the trial is currently being done here in the U.S. And there are the five sites that I showed in, in my slides. Uh, you know, and the two on the west coast. Uh, that if people are interested, they can uh, uh, ask us and we can facilitate to put them in contact with these two centers to see whether you would qualify and, and whether it would be accessible for you to go back and forth for these trials. And I, I, I mean, I agree. I don't know of anything outside overseas, but I will say I think if someone, something has a strong signal that it's working, would hear about it just as like Radhakava. I mean, I know some patients that were going to India or other countries and actually importing their own radicava while it was going through our FDA here. Um, so. I think a follow-up question to that and something we hear in our community 
with people living with ALS is that there may be alternative or off-label therapies that people may try independently. Um, are there programs that are looking at some of those sort of either naturopathic or alternative medications? So probably the, the best person to ask this question is somebody who you invited two years ago, who is Dr. Bedlack at Duke, who's a good friend of uh, both of us, I think. And, uh, you know, he led some of the trial on, um, what was that called? The, uh, remember the name of that supplement? Lysine. Uh, yeah. What, what is it? Is it lysine? Lysine, yeah, the one you could just buy on Amazon, and I think this didn't show, and now he's working on something else. Yeah, a great source for sort of some of those alternative off-label therapy investigations to look and see if there is scientific merit for them is ALSUntangled.org, which is a, a re collaborative research program coordinated by Richard Bedlack from, the university, from Duke University ALS Clinic. So all these papers are available for free, uh, depending on what you're looking for, and uh, we kind of, ALS researcher, collaborate to, to kind of give their opinion on different, uh, like the Diana protocol and different supplements that are available, uh, just you can buy from online or anything like that. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, there's nothing really promising at this point, and without clinical trials, it's impossible to know whether one is working or not. And um, we have to be careful because although a lot of time there's no major side effects, but sometimes these supplements can actually have side effects depending on who's manufacturing them and what are kind of the standard of manufacturing these drugs is. Okay, another question from the room. Hi. Um, Dr. Krom, thank you for coming. He's our doctor and we love him very much. And thank you for the seminar. It's our first time coming to the seminar. And our question would be about the new trial on CRISPR, what that's all about. We saw it on 60 Minutes. Mm. Um, so CRISPR is a, is a technology for gene editing. And uh, currently, I'm not aware of anything in, in clinical trials in, in patients with ALS. Uh, on CRISPR and, and ALS. Any of, any of the other have a, understand CRISPR or its benefit that might work in? So CRISPR is a remarkable technique for working with experimental animals and it's being moved into humans, but it will be used in the best case, the simplest things where you can say isolate a cell, treat it, put it back in that may affect cancer. It's going to be really tough at ALS because motor neurons are probably the hardest area to access. And how do you go about actually making it work? Um, and so that I don't know of anything that's going on specifically in ALS proposed in humans. That doesn't mean there aren't a lot of ideas and things being weighed. Um, so it's coming. I too saw that uh, 60 Minutes piece, and you know, and um, as news stories, they also tend to have an arc to make things extremely exciting, and it, it, things are exciting because um, these seeds grow into something, but it takes a lot of work by people like um, Dr. Beckman and the clinicians to get them further down the road. And I was remark remarked several times where both uh, Dr. Olney and Dr. Me Beckman talked about their undergraduates having to do some incredibly uh, hard, s slow work. And so sometimes how things are reported uh, underlie, sort of does it, glosses over the amount of like basic work that has to go on underneath these technologies moving forward. Other questions? Oh. Yeah, have you done any work on uh, SOD1 and your copper ATSM together? 
So the experimental work that we're doing is in a model that just is SOD and Cabre TSM, and we've done lots of work on characterizing that. The question that I usually get that is a bit more uh, general, and the clinicians will say this, only 2 to 3% of patients have SOD mutations. Would you expect this to work in other patients? Okay. And this is where, in the scientific community, there can be arguments going back and forth. The study sections that reviewed my grants get really angry when I say it, could, it should work better in people without SOD mutations than with. It's a theoretical argument, and they say, you don't know that. And I said, but that's why I'm asking for money to do the experiments. But I did mean to mention uh, one other study. It's only five mice. Uh, it's done by Chris Shaw up in Vancouver, Canada. And Chris studies the Guam form of ALS. So the one place where there's an unusually high incidence of ALS is on the island of Guam, and it happened after World War II. And they still don't understand where it comes from. But he's isolated a toxin from the cycad nuts. It's a cholesterol-like molecule. Can feed it to mice and rats, and they get some motor neuron-like disease. So he gave copper ATSM. I sent a bunch to him, so I gave it for a year. There's some pretty dramatic effects on protection. And there's some hints in other models. And in Parkinson's disease, the compound works. It works in multiple sclerosis. Um, there's some evidence that is suggestive it might have an effect in Alzheimer's. So it means that the mechanism I was studying in this very specific mouse model may not be why this compound's really working. And that's what I was trying to allude to at the very end of the talk, that it actually has another activity um, that is, may explain why we need to give much higher doses than we thought. And that's why you have, also have to do these studies in a very systematic way to collect a lot of data and do different doses and being very rigorous in it. Because a single dose um, or you know, one patient tr trying it actually could be very misleading in a lot of different ways. Okay. Didn't you, didn't you originally say that, that uh, copper ATSM helped transport the copper? Into the brain. Uh, that's right. And, and, and we so set up a mouse model that the, the mice that were dying when they were very young, it was clearly they needed copper in the brain, and we can show we can deliver it, and we optimize the properties for that. So I've spent maybe four years of my life working on it. Now I'm thinking it might have another activity. And I don't mind that, but I have a friend in Australia who four years ago said it's not copper delivery in the brain. And you know we've wrestled over beers out of this for years. And I have to say, you might be right. And that really hurts my feelings. I've <laughs> Yeah. I saw a question over here. Um, along with the brainstorm, talking about that, I heard they were having a conference call yesterday on whether how would it affect people with the right to try, try legislation. Do you know how that turned out? So I, I think you're trying to ask, I, does the right to try legislation that recently just passed through Congress affect people's access to things like brainstorm or other potentially treatments? Brainstorm specifically okay. said what they were going to do yesterday. Okay. That's a good question. Um, it, I think it really depends on what Brainstorm wants to do because they have the technology to, you know, these cells that are taking from the bone marrow are um, kind of cultivated and incited into secreting specific factors. And so this is a specific technology that Brainstorm has, and um, they're not just taking stem cell and injecting them, which 
people can basically do anywhere, and that's what a lot of clinic outside of the US, even in the US, probably do when they advertise that they do stem cell. Uh, what uh, in ALS, the research is being done on these cells, uh, uh, educating them and programming them to, to uh, secrete specific factors to help protect the cells. Now, if Brainstorm decides that they don't want to do the trials anymore and they're going to offer this technology to whoever is going to pay, then that's going to be their own thing. But I, I, I doubt that it's going to happen. But I may be wrong. I mean, money can drive people in different ways. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I would share, you know, on the public policy side of, of our organization, it's an exciting time. You know, there have been 40 states who passed right to try laws. Now their federal right to try law has been passed, and federal law uh, oversees or uh, trumps the state laws. Um, access to experimental therapies is a challenging topic because you've heard a lot of discussion about the need for efficiency and a lot of reduplication of testing and efforts to find if these things really are effective. And I think uh, Dr. Beckman's slides that showed multiple clinic, multiple labs reproducing results showing effectiveness gives a sense of confidence that these drugs are doing what, what they were advertised to do or what their initial studies said. Um, the FDA has had a program of expanded access that um, uh, people with ALS and their clinicians can work towards and, and go through an application process to get early access to some drugs that have gone through phase one trials. Um, we're interesting to see what happens with right to try. To date, none of the state laws actually, to my knowledge, and I could, I certainly am not going to say I'm an expert, actually developed any access to people getting drugs. And there's a concern that, that a right to try law may be a feel good law. But, but without some um, support for pharmaceutical companies or biotechs to make um, the potential treatments available to people earlier uh, than FDA approval, um, you know, there's just a lot of barriers there, particularly with the concern being that a drug company may worry that if they give early access to people and adverse events happen, that could derail their significant investments. The other piece that, which is one of the things that I would say we have a concern about as an organization, is that we don't want to create an environment where only the very, very, very extremely wealthy people can have access to therapy. And one of the challenges is, is it could be that if someone gets access to right to try, well, the drug itself may cost $500,000 and that's not going to be covered by insurance, so only if you're extremely wealthy can you have access to treatment. And we certainly want to advocate for a effective treatments available to everyone through all the normal paying mechanisms because uh, when, when there's a treatment that's effective for ALS, we want everyone to have access to it. So I'd like to add, I heard a talk, it was maybe eight or 10 years ago, and it's by a prominent French clinician who works on ALS. But to put it in perspective, he just did put together lots of different trials that have been tried in ALS, just the placebo group from the treatment group. And the really depressing uh, part of it was the treated groups on average did worse than the placebo group. And so that's one of the things to keep in mind that, you know, there are a lot of drugs out there and a lot of things are trying and we just don't know if it's going to cause harm or good. And that's the reason for doing these trials. As painful as they are, as slow as they are, you really have to understand and do this in a blinded way because it's very easy to deceive yourself in uh, early results. And there's just lots of examples of a lot of harm being done because the initial results looked very promising, not just in ALS, but lots of different diseases. And that's the reason why people are basically really hard-nosed about these trials. Um, um, I have a question, actually, for Nick. Uh, we've been talking a lot about um, drug development, but there's an important role in research for clinical management. Can you talk about why that's important as well? 
job for clinical management? Clinical management to improve quality of care and, and better outcomes for, for management of symptoms. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think a lot of the emphasis, yeah, just be making sure that, um, you know, patients are always going to the multidisciplinary clinics, getting the whole team to assess everything, because I think, um, you know, now I'm a part of a multidisciplinary clinic, but definitely I think that's what my dad was always advocating for, is that everyone, upon diagnosis, get there, because those are the things you have to monitor. So, because you really need to treat everyone like an individual as well and see what problems they might come up with, and it's nice to have access to the team members that can then handle those. Great, thanks. Other questions? Yeah, um, I heard you say that you were exploring other compounds beyond copper ATSM, and I was actually curious if those are being tested in any kind of animal models right now. Um, and then my second question is just more uh, sheer curiosity. You said one of them was a coffee flavor, and I was actually curious what that was. <laughs> so, yeah, I like the coffee flavoring angle. Um, so yes, we've, they've all been tested in animals and working up the way up and trying to get interest in, you know, would they be the second generation compound? So the way you make copper ATSM, you start with rocket fuel, the chemical that killed all the people in Bhopal, India, and then uh, the key ingredient to link them is uh, called diacetyl. It's the smell of popcorn. So if you go into a movie theater and the fake butter, that's diacetyl. It's also the smell that makes, uh, gives uh, butter. I mean, if beer goes bad, it's because of diacetyl. You smell that and you know the beer is really bad. So we were investigating. We made 100 some compounds and tested them in animals. And almost all do much worse than copper ATSM. And this started to work. And I started to look at how do I scale it up? And I started to look of, you know, how do I order the backbone to make it? And instead of the $100 I paid for a gram, I discovered I could buy a kilogram for less than a dollar, then realized uh, it's a common flavoring in coffee for artificial coffee. It's a food additive. So that's what I like is starting with that, and then we can go make our compound from there. Right, it's the first step in the synthesis. And it sounds bad, but after you mix everything together, it actually is incredibly stable. Next question, please. Yep, there we go. On the subject of building a better general understanding for the disease, I'm curious if there are any studies targeted at individuals that have not actually been diagnosed with ALS but have tested positive for a genetic mutation that's linked with hereditary ALS? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm aware of uh, at least the CREATE consortium out of Florida that's following asymptomatic gene carriers. I mean, so I think that, um, yeah, that, I mean, that'd be the main people I know of in the nation. And, but that brings up uh, you know interesting concept too. If something shows promising first in patients that are effective, would you then roll it out to? I mean, you already said maybe not SOB1 mutations would be the patient you're pop you know targeting, but you know those specific patients. And some of the from the Florida studies, um, for instance, the A4V mutation in SOD is really widespread, and it's really pretty tragic because when people develop the disease they'll die typically in 12 to 18 months. Um, and we had a patient in two years ago here that, um, who was very young and healthy and was gone very quickly. Uh, but the longitudinal study shows that actually there's a phase where you can actually see the symptoms appearing that's fairly long, and then it accelerates. And so that offers the opportunity that maybe we really can get to the disease earlier. And if copper ATSM is really effective in the way I think it is, we could consider giving it prophylactically, in other words, before the disease happens, to try to prevent it from starting. Really tough, though, if you think about how do you prove the drug's working if you're preventing the disease. And there's no way to know when the disease starts. And one thing I could add, to with that group is uh, it's Dr. Benatar. Michael Benatar is very active in the neurofilament research. And that I was, I had a little hint in mind of that. I started that a little at UCSF. But um, 
his idea is he's actually following it in asymptomatic gene carriers and has a theory that that will likely spike maybe even months or maybe even a year or so before people have any physical symptoms. I mean, he has yet to prove that yet, but that's one of the many kind of fluid biomarkers he's testing. So. Next question. I have two questions, one for Dr. Olney and one for Dr. Beckman. Um, you talked about the uncontrolled laughter, and I was curious, my 13-year-old boy has uncontrolled laughter, and he certainly has an underdeveloped brain. Hmm. And wondering if you've seen similarities, or if you even thought to study the brain maybe degeneration of an older ALS patient with uncontrolled laughter and an adolescent because they tend to be the ones that can have uncontrolled laughter. Yeah. And then for Dr. Beckman, has there been any research, you did talk about uh, SOD, superoxide dismutase, and levels uh, in the body of being increased or decreased and a correlation to the development of ALS. I can, go first. Yeah, I can start. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think yeah, I mean, I think that the, for the pseudobulbar effect, I mean, I think some of it is really a change in people's kind of degree, because I think everyone probably knows, like, a laugher or a, someone who's going to, like, you know, laugh all the time in a movie, and so there, those people, even on our scale, the CNS lability scale, will probably be scoring off the charts already, whether they had ALS or not, so I think a lot of it's the people who probably are more like twos or threes on the scale that then go up to a 20 or whatever that would change, but I think the actual, like, what, you know, what part of the brains are being affected, I mean, now that I've gone through more general neurology, I do think there probably is something more to do with the brain stem, and maybe these are just totally unregulatable kind of events, um, but I actually think, just one other thing I didn't get added to my talks, I mean, I actually think how you ask people, so I usually ask people in clinic, do you have now episodes of emotion that are more difficult to control? Um, I sometimes see other people asking, like, do you have mixed emotions? I don't think that's quite it. I think it's really this regulating um, the emotions that's the, the main thing to look for. I think that answers can that just be normal uh, developmental behavior as well? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I think, like I said, I think that some control, la like, uncontrollable laughter, I mean, I think everyone's had that. I think that's why some people kind of connect with the, this, this project. I often have sh I've shown this to, I did double major biochemistry theater. I've shown this to some of my theater friends, and they identify with that. But I think if you looked at kind of these pseudobulbar affect, episodes probably compared to a normal uncontrolled laughter, they, I think they do look different. I mean, no one's really directly quantified those in a lab or anything yet, but I think, I think that, I think some level of uncontrolled laughter happens in life, so, yeah. And the question about SOD concentrations, there's a vast literature on it. The copper ATSM has this very unusual, or one of the exciting parts of it is it's stabilizing SOD, so actually there's two or three times more SOD in the mice that are running around at a year and a half to two years old than it's been ever seen in any other animal. So it's the idea of you can actually stabilize the protein with the metals uh, and that it becomes non-toxic is one of the really key findings in that study. Great, another question over here. Wait for the microphone so everyone can hear, please. Thank you. Uh, the marijuana oil, Rick Simpson oil. I know for my husband it works for the drooling and his cramping. And no one ever brings that up. And I tell you, it makes a huge difference for him. So I wonder what you guys, your comments are on that. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we are in Oregon, and uh, a lot of our ALS patients are on some sort of compound, and they know, you guys know much more than I do about these things. Um, we get drug tested by OHSU, so we yeah. cannot do these things. But uh, <laughs> definitely, there's probably a lot of benefits, and since it's available, you know, to anybody, basically, there's no big incentive to, I think, do research from one pharmaceutical company. Um, I was approached by uh, by a, a, a company that that makes those compounds, and they wanted to do studies um, 
but we do have, uh, it's, it's kind of complicated to do these kind of studies at OHSU uh, for several reasons that I'm not going to go into details in, but uh, basically makes us a little bit more, um, and, or uh, this encouraged us to kind of proceed that it's going to take a lot of work to, to do such a trial. Um, but uh, I, I hear you, I hear a lot of my patients getting benefits from them and I tell them to, you know, go to and, and experiment with them, that's totally fine. I, I don't really have anything else to add. Yeah, I mean... There you go, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think I haven't seen anyone setting up trials, but I hear people saying they help. So, I mean, if things help and they're not dangerous, then... Well, I want to thank all of you for coming today and for uh, your time and attention and everyone online who's watched uh, our stream. I think one of the things that I'm proud of is our community and our commitment to um, empowering ourselves with knowledge about ALS research. Um, without that knowledge and, and the support that comes by generating the public policy advocacy and the ALS research funding, uh, the needle doesn't move. So we continue to do everything we can to support ALS research um, across a wide span of things from basic science to clinical management to drug development to gene understanding the genetics, understanding the environmental aspects that are part of the disease, as well as some of the complementary therapies that may, may be beneficial. Um, I'm thrilled to actually, with this particular panel, to highlight three of the strong players in our community uh, who are making a difference for people with ALS. And, and they're a little understated, but also I know that each and every one of them uh, really go to the mat every day for people living with ALS by continuing their work, but also particularly with Dr. Karam and soon to be Dr. Olney with the clinical management support for patients. So thank you all for being here and thank you all for your work.